Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Jackie. I work for the Ann Arbor District Library, and uh, we're very honored to continue this program with the University of Michigan. Um, I just have one thing I'd like to mention before we get started. Uh, we are recording this program tonight, so at the end of the program, we're going to uh, open it up for questions, and I'm going to ask that uh, questions be directed to the microphone. I will run around with the microphone, so if you can just raise your hands, um, I will bring the microphone to you. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Uh, Chris Monk, and he's going to introduce our guest. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, so my name is Chris Monk. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology here at the University of Michigan. So tonight, I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Tori uh, Bergman join us to discuss his research. Uh, Dr. Bergman is a professor in the Department of Psychology as well as the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Michigan. He completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, where he studied zoology and biological aspects of conservation. He then received his PhD in population and evolutionary biology from Washington University in St. Louis, and he was then a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, where he studied communication and cognition in baboons in Botswana. He then uh, joined us here at the University of Michigan in 2006. Uh, his research examines uh, social behavior and social cognition from an evolutionary framework. Uh, specifically, he assesses how dominance and family relationships structure primate social groups. Uh, he is also interested in vocal communication and sexual selection processes, particularly looking at how primates assess competitors as well as potential mates. To answer these research questions, Dr. Bergman studies three types of free-ranging non-human primates in the wild. Uh, one, baboons in Ethiopia and Botswana. Two, uh, gelata, gelata, sorry. <laughs> gelata monkeys in Ethiopia. And uh, three, howler monkeys in Mexico. His research involves observation, vocal recordings, and hormonal as well as genetic sampling. Dr. Bergman is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science, and he has received ample funding from the National Science Foundation, as well as funding from the National Geographic Society, the Leakey Foundation, as well as the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Bergman's talk, as you can see here, is titled The Origins of Language, From Picking Fleas to Shooting the Breeze. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tori Bergman. Great, thank you for that nice introduction and thank you all for being here. I'm excited to get to talk about my research in kind of a big picture context, what it all means. Uh, so I will be talking about the origins of language and I'm really gonna be focusing on what I'm doing right now, which is producing sounds to communicate. So the speech part of language, the vocal part of language. And I will be talking about gelato monkeys, which uh, we study in the mountains of Ethiopia over here, so. All right. So. Language is this thing and speech is something that we're so immersed in and we do it all the time that I think we often don't realize how amazing and unusual some of our abilities are. So I want to take a, a few minutes to try and you know, frame how strange we are and how kind of amazing we are at doing vocal things. So this is a quick video. It starts um, with a beep sound. So there's some swear words in here. I've made it family friendly. Uh, but just you'll, you'll get what's happening here and it'll happen kind of quick, but just you'll see. Outside. It's just a goat. No, it's a goat. <laughs> what? All right, so I really like this video, um, not just because toddler swearing is funny, which it is, um, but it, it captures a lot of the things that humans do that are really kind of special. Um, let me, let's just watch it again. So you, you kind of can maybe get a sense of what's happened here is that the mom looked out the window and saw this goat and said the phrase, and the kid picked it up immediately and looked out the window to see and, and was really excited to label this new thing and, and, and do this thing. So, going outside. It's just a goat. Mom, it's a fucking goat. <laughs> what? And so what I think is cool from a language kind of perspective is that this kid heard this one time, sort of accidentally really, it doesn't seem like the mom wanted the kid to hear it even, um, copied it back perfectly immediately. I also looked out the window to see what mom was looking at and associated this new sound that they'd never heard before with this thing out the window. 
was really excited to share with mom, looks at mom for approval, like, look what I did, isn't expecting food or any kind of reward, but just the joy of communicating is enough. Um, and then it's just so disappointed when mom says no and kind of changed the rules mid midstream and checks out the window to confirm, like, no, I, I saw the thing you saw, and like, you're the one who's wrong. And so that whole process is just pretty incredible. Um, and the thing I really want to focus, though, on is the, the vocal mimicry. This kid just heard this new sound for the first time, maybe there's a sequence of sounds for sure for the first time, and immediately reproduced them perfectly. That's something that other animals just do not do. Uh, even the really good mimics, like the parrots and things that we keep as pets that can learn human speech, takes many, many, many exposures and repetitions and practice. They're not very good at it, and they get better at it and things like that. They can't do it immediately on, on one exposure like this. So how does this compare to chimpanzees? Well, here's a, a study from the 1950s where they tried to teach a chimpanzee to speak. Research psychologist Dr. Keith Hayes and his wife raised a chimp named Vicky. After constant training, Vicky had learned to speak only three human words by the time she was three years old. Like human babies, she babbled at first. <coughs> Later, she was rewarded when she made the right sounds. Mrs. Hayes would shape Vicky's lips to help her pronounce the word mama. At the age of two and a half, she could say papa and cup. Now she has learned to use all three of her words appropriately in solicitation. Now, who am I? Papa? Papa? So there's a glitch in this old video. Research psychologist Dr. Keith Hayes and his wife raised a chimp named Vicky. Mm -hmm. After con... Can you say what this is? That was supposed to be cup. By the age of six, Vicky's spoken vocabulary consisted of seven words, whereas human children are using hundreds of words by the time they're only two years old. Chimpanzees, orangutans, and other mammals may have larynxes and the rest of the speech mechanism, but it takes more than that. It takes brain power. Okay, so there you see like three years to teach three words, and I would say to not really teach three words. Like, you know, imagine spending a year trying to teach a chimp to say cup, and then that's the best they can do is. <coughs> okay, so, <clears throat> a huge difference between the kid and the, the chimpanzee there. And so, well, what explains this difference? Well, maybe it's just that humans are smart. We have these big brains. We put people on the moon. We, we do all these things. Um, so maybe we're just you know, really good at learning stuff. And so you know, for people without kids in the audience, maybe you think kids are just really good at learning stuff. I can assure you they're not. So <laughs> it's not everything they just pick up automatically. Um, I, the, the hours I've spent you know, teaching my kids to tie their shoes, and you demonstrate it for them, and you move their hands, and you have little songs for the sequence of events you do. Um, and they're still terrible at it, so sorry kids, <laughs> but <laughs> you're not very good at it. So, you know, it's not that we just learn everything really easily. We're just, we learn sounds really easy. That's the thing that we're really amazing at doing and reproducing. Okay, well maybe it's not really fair because we're comparing a kid speaking their own language to a chimpanzee trying to learn another species sound. So what about their own sounds? How do primates learn to make their own sounds? Well. There's a fair bit of evidence there's not much learning going on there either. So the sounds that they make seem to be pretty innate. And there's some studies done back in the 50s and 60s where you can do things like completely isolate a baby monkey from its mother from the day it's born. And these are some of the studies that Harry Harlow did on social attachment. They're pretty famous studies and they're pretty horrible studies. Um, we probably shouldn't do these again. But you know what you end up with, with is a monkey that's fairly messed up being raised without its mother. But one thing that's not all that messed up, surprisingly, are the vocalizations. So it still will produce kind of the typical sounds that a macaque will make, even though it was isolated completely from its mother from a young age. You can also do other things, and people have done these things, like deafen the monkeys in utero before they're born, so they never have any auditory input at all in their lifetime, and they still will produce vocalizations that are pretty normal sounding. Uh, you can also switch them between species, so you can take a baby from one species and have it be raised by a mom of another species, and they will still produce their own vocalizations, not their adopted species vocalizations. So a lot of these studies were done you know, a while ago, and they sort of um, made it pretty clear that there's not a lot of learning going on in primate vocalizations. Okay, so we have this enormous gap here. And one way to think about it is if you were, say, an alien that visited Earth 10 million years ago, and you were told that in several million years, one species on the planet is going to take over the whole planet, and they're going to do it mainly based on their ability to communicate with sound. You would never guess that that would be a primate. OK, 
Okay, so this really sort of surprising thing you never predicted, but it did happen. So how do we explain it? Where, where did, how did we get from there to here? Well, let's start with the simple things. Maybe we can get at some of the very earliest steps towards um, some of our language and speech abilities. So is there any evidence that primates can modify their vocalizations, maybe in more natural contexts than some of these really artificial experiments? And so this is one project that I was involved in uh, a few years ago, looking at howler monkeys in Mexico. So these are monkeys that are famous for their vocalizations. They have these large vocal sacs, and they produce really loud roars, some of the loudest sounds that any primates make. Uh, the interesting thing in Mexico is that there's two different species. So there's a mantled and a black howler monkey, so they look different. They also sound different, too. And so um, I was interested to, to go research these monkeys because there's a hybrid zone where the two species come in contact, and they produce mixed individuals. And so in this hybrid zone, you can have pure polyata animals or pure mantled animals, pure bl black howlers, and then mixed animals all living right together. And so they can, they're close enough that they can hear each other, they interact with each other, things like that. And so I thought it was interesting from a sort of vocal development standpoint. Uh, just to show you what they sound like, so I'll play you first the howler monkey vocalization. So this is their loud roar. You can see these spectrograms kind of are a visual representation of the sound with the frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Um, this is the pure mantle call. Over here is a pure black howler call, and then the hybrids in the middle. Um, so I'll play them for you so you can not just see, but hear these differences. So there's some sort of back and forth in that sound. It kind of um, has some structure to it, whereas you'll hear the, the black uh, roar is, is different. So it's just one big, long syllable, so very different sounds. The cool thing was not just that these hybrids make kind of intermediate sounds, but the pure mantled howler monkeys that live in contact with the, the other ones, their vocalizations have shifted in that direction. And so they extended their syllables, and they make more like these elongated roars like the other species. So there's evidence that they are picking up something from their environment and changing their vocalizations that way. And there are now lots of examples of these kinds of more subtle shifts in vocal learning or vocal modification. So they're not learning an entirely new call, but they're adjusting the calls that they make um, depending on the context. Another example comes from uh, tamarins, which are monogamous monkeys in South America. And so these animals live in pairs. And what this study showed was that in an artificial setting where they would take a male and a female that didn't know each other, put them together in a cage. After a few weeks, they will form a bonded pair. And what they noticed was that after a couple of weeks, their vocalizations started to sound alike. And so again, you see these spectrogram representations of what the calls look like. On the left are a male and female from cage one, and on the right are a male and female from cage two. And you can see that those calls represent each other in that cage. So the, the calls of the partners converge on each other, and they end up sounding like each other. So again, some evidence for some ability to modify their, their calls based on the input and the sounds that they're hearing. OK. So I'm mainly focused on sounds and speech, but I want to take a bit of a detour here to talk about gestures and um, nonverbal communication, because I think this is an area where maybe some people have heard about the abilities of, of apes and, and other monkeys. And it's definitely an area where they show more flexibility in their communication. And so what you'll see in this video clip is a, uh, this male chimpanzee down here will be gesturing to the partner over there, and they'll do a variety of different gestures that you'll see. So that's a branch shake. Rohar is looking up at it's a loud scratch, so it's like an exaggerated scratch that draws attention. Rose is in a different tree. Scratching. Part is kind of reluctant to respond. I'm raising and shaking. So there you can see there's a variety of different gestures used, and these gestures that they use, first of all, there's a, a greater number of different gestures they use than there are vocalizations. Um, they seem to use them a bit more flexibly, and there's some variation across populations and groups and the gestures that they use, and they seem to learn them from each other and adopt them from each other. They combine them together, so there are a bunch of gestures happening there at once. 
So they did do lots of things with gestures that they don't do with vocalizations. So it's an interesting sort of avenue for more flexible communication. Um, based on this, you know, greater flexibility with gestures and just general greater manual dexterity, uh, some of the early language projects quickly shifted from trying to teach chimpanzees to speak, like they did with the Viki, um, to trying to teach them things like sign language. Or also, more recently, they tried to do things like teach them to use lexigrams, so touch symbols on a, on a keyboard. And so I'll show you this video clip um, that describes some of this history a little better than I can just explain it to you, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. There's a long history of humans trying to get apes to talk to them, but will we ever get close to a true conversation? Could an ape ever learn to use language the way humans do? Good questions. Scientific efforts to talk to animals have often focused on the great apes, our closest, cleverest cousins. I grew up believing that apes could talk to humans using sign language. I remember this one Reading Rainbow episode about a gorilla named Coco. Who is that? Think me there. That's very good. This blew my mind. Here was an animal who could talk to me. But years later in college, my dream was shattered by Professor Robert Sapolsky. He said in a lecture that all that stuff with Coco was baloney. There were no data. Scientists couldn't make any sense of it because there were no numbers. There was no anything you can actually analyze. And then you look at the films, your socks knew more American Sign Language than this gorilla did. Wait, what? Can Coco use language or not? Looking for answers, I dove into the long history of ape language studies. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. I can't see the numbers. I was convinced. But other people were a bit more skeptical. People like Herbert Terrace, a psychologist at Columbia. He was working with another ape, Nim Chimpsky. Nim used a bunch of signs, just like Washoe and Coco, but Terrace took a cold, hard look at the videos of Nim, and he also went back and analyzed the videos of other apes. He said all those claims about ape language were nothing but wishful thinking. Take the idea that apes could combine signs to form new meanings. Maybe when Washoe saw a swan and signed water bird, she was just separately pointing out water and a bird. But his skepticism went much further. He doubted the apes even understood the words they were signing. When the trainers would ask questions, the apes would just guess at the right sign. They look for cues in the trainer's body language or simply mimic the trainer's gestures. The apes weren't using language like we would to ask questions or express opinions. They just wanted to get food and affection. Nim's longest recorded sentence was, Give orange me, give eat orange me, eat orange, give me eat orange, give me you. Tara said the trainers were like parents eager to see their child learning. They'd confidently interpret vague gestures and find the meanings they were looking for. Plenty of people objected to Terrace's study, in large part because they said Nim was treated really badly. But the damage to Nim and the whole field was done. Funding for ape language research dried up. So where does that leave us? Are all these claims of talking apes baloney? Well, here's one more study that's still going on. Kanzi is a bonobo, a smaller cousin of the chimpanzee. He doesn't use hand signs, he uses these icons called lexigrams. He selects them on a screen. This one represents dog, this one is tickle, this one, yogurt. The touchscreen system is less ambiguous than hand signing. We can be more certain that Kanzi is choosing his words intentionally, and there's less room for humans to overinterpret what they think he's saying. The results are a bit more scientifically rigorous. And what do these results show? Kanzi knows hundreds of lexigrams, and he uses them correctly nine times out of ten. Blueberries. Blueberry. And he also seems to get some abstract ideas, like bad or good. But he rarely combines lexigrams to convey new ideas. Most of the time, he just uses them to get things he likes. Blueberry. 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 When people combine words he knows to create... All right. 
So um, that's a fairly skeptical view of the eight language projects, um, but I think you know it's a pretty good summary of some of it. Clearly, they're better at the manual languages than they are at the spoken languages, but still quite a ways to go. Um, but you know, because they are better at, at some of the, the more manual uh, language things, sign language, and also because of their ability with gestures, some people have proposed that perhaps gestures were an early route to language. And so along the development towards language, the evolution of language, we went through a gestural stage and we had a fairly elaborate gestural communication system, sort of like a sign language, and then only later ported that over to a spoken system that we use today. Um, I think this is an interesting idea, but it hasn't garnered a ton of support. And I think there are some issues with it, which is one is that it's not parsimonious. And what we mean by that is it's not a very simple explanation in the sense that if we're trying to explain the origin of a spoken language, and when we're positing what happened is that first we created a gestural language and then later a spoken language, now we have two things that we need to explain. We have to explain how we got a gestural language and then how we got a spoken language after that too. So it doesn't really help us too much. Um, the other thing is kind of a puzzle is if we did evolve an elaborate signing system, why did we lose that ability? It seems like it would be pretty useful to be able to communicate silently in lots of situations. Um, you know, you imagine you want to gossip about the jerk across the room who's not looking at you or, you know, out in the wild if there's a lion behind the bush and your friend doesn't know about it, you want to let them know without the lion letting you know that you're there, all these things. You know, if, you, you would think if we had it, why not keep it around? Um, but then also my main issue is that it just doesn't explain the spoken part. Like why, you know, how did we get the spoken part that we use today? So we still want to understand that part of the story too. Okay. So I think gestures are important. They're related to language. They're you know, used in a lot of spoken communication. Is, it's done together with gestures, uh, but we don't know exactly how they fit in. OK. So that was a detour into gestures. Uh, back to this issue of why apes are so bad at speech. So um, there's this huge gap between us and, and our closest relatives. People have long proposed that maybe it's an anatomical problem. So, We've known for centuries that the vocal anatomy and the, the upper vocal tract of humans is quite different from that of our close relatives. And so you have a human and a chimpanzee here. And the main difference between the humans and the chimpanzees is that in chimpanzees and most other uh, primates and most other mammals, the larynx or their vocal cords are right at the base of the mouth. And so they're right sort of behind the mouth, whereas in humans, they've descended and they're sort of in the middle of our throat. And what that means is that we have this fairly long vertical part, the pharynx in purple there, and then we have a, a right angle and a horizontal part that comes out of our mouth. Some of this, the arrangement probably has to do with walking upright and our more vertical posture, but that descending of the larynx and this right angle gives us potentially a more complex system to work with to manipulate sounds, and so maybe that gives us some advantage in creating complex sounds. Um, the chimpanzees, the, the larynx is right at the base of the mouth and it forms a really shallow angle with their mouth, so it's just a simpler structure. We, we know or some more evidence that it's related to producing speech is that kids are born with the larynx at the back of the mouth the way other animals have, and it slowly descends over the first few years of life. And that descent coincides with them getting better at producing speech. Okay, so you can kind of think of it this way, that maybe the chimpanzees are stuck with the kazoo, and it's really hard to make nice music with a kazoo. Uh, apologies to kazoo aficionados in the audience. Um, and you know, maybe we just have a nicer instrument and it's easier to make the sounds come out of our, our vocal tract. So to think about this a bit more, I wanna explain some of the details of how the sound is actually produced. So there's this source filter theory of speech production. And the idea is that the source is the vocal cords, that's what vibrates and produces the sound, and the sound then passes through the vocal tract, so through the mouth and the nasal cavities, um, and things like that, and that's the filter. And the shape of that filter will emphasize some frequencies and um, attenuate other frequencies or dampen other frequencies. And so that'll affect the sound that comes out. And so what comes out is a product of both the source and the filter that it goes through. So this is what um, speech looks like in the spectrogram. So again, this is the frequency on the y-axis, so higher uh, frequency is higher pitch sounds. It's time across the bottom, and this is a spectrogram of a person saying, I'm sitting in a room. And what I want you to notice and pay attention to are these dark bands of energy here. And so the darker the, the um, a color here on the graph, the more energy there is, the louder sound is at that frequency. And you can see that there's these dark smeary bands. These are called formants, and these are a really important part of speech. And you'll see that these formants are moving around as you're person is adjusting their vocal tract, adjusting their filter as the sound passes through, 
And what's really critical for our understanding of speech is the spacing between these formats. So here they're really far apart, here they're really close together. And the spacing between those formats affects which vowels we perceive. <clears throat> so uh, just to show a simple example of the source filter, so over here we have two different sources at different frequency. The one on the top has pulses at a lower frequency, so it'll sound lower pitch to us. Uh, the second one is higher frequency, sounds higher pitch. And these two filters, we can pass through, these two sources, we can pass through filters. The first filter is an ah sound filter, so it's a vocal track in a shape that would make an ah sound. And what it does is it makes the first two formats, F1 and F2, close together. So that's what's happening in this sound. In the E sound, so a vocal tract set up to make an E sound is the filter it's passing through. Uh, it, the two formants get pushed apart. So that's all that's really happening with the sound, and you'll hear some of the differences. So first you'll hear the sources. That's the low one, high one. So it's a really simple sound, like it's, you know, but now watch what happens when we filter it. First the ah. Oops, ah and then E, so you hear those two different sounds. So it's the same source passed through those two different filters. Now we hear those two different vowel sounds. It, same thing with the high frequency sound. Ah, E. Okay. All right, so that's the source and the filter. That's to get us to this point of an early study in monkeys looked at the vocal anatomy of macaques, and they used a dead macaque, so a cadaver, and they tried to manipulate the vocal tract as much as they could to to sort of model the range of sounds that this vocal tract could produce. And what this study found was that the macaque was very limited. It could not produce many different sounds. It could only produce a very small subset of the sounds that we use when we make speech. Um, however, that was sort of the prevailing wisdom for 40 years. Recently, a study has shown that actually that's not so true. And so if you use a living macaque that's um, actually behaving and, and moving around, Put it in an x-ray machine so you can see where different parts of the vocal tract are moving as it's doing things like chewing and just behaving and interacting. Um, you can get a much better sense of the range of movement that's possible in the vocal tract. And if you do that, you can um, then you model the vocal tract shape at do, during different activities. You can simulate sound passing through it, and then you get the sort of sound out at the end and, and have an understanding of what that sounds like. And what they found is that, so first, this is the human vowel space, so the, um, the vocal space that humans use, the first formant on the x-axis, the second formant on the y-axis. The letters indicate essentially the vowel sound that's being produced at that point. And so this is oo sound, and this is e, and this is ah over here. And so that sort of encapsulates the vowel space that humans make um, in most languages. If you then compare that to the macaque, so this red line now is the human vowel space that I just showed you. The blue line is the original study with the dead macaque, and this dashed line is the new one with the living macaque. You can see it's sort of shifted up a little bit higher frequency. That doesn't matter too much. Um, it's just a smaller animal. Uh, but the size of this space is roughly equivalent to what humans can do. So that suggests they can make enough different sounds that they could produce um, speech-like vocalizations. And to further demonstrate the fact the authors had simulated uh, human vocal tract and the monkey vocal tract making this speech pattern of will you marry me? And I don't know why they chose that, it's kind of strange. Um, what, so you, you'll hear in a second what they did is they took a sort of white noise and passed it through um, simulated vocal tracts from human or macaque that are trying to say this phrase. Will you marry me? So that's the human one, kind of creepy. And that's the macaque. Even creepier, I'd say. And I think the answer to the question is definitely no, if you hear that question. Um, but at least you can understand it. You can tell what they're saying. And so the macaques can make enough speech that they could be understood. Okay. Um, so we've done some work in our, this area, too. And so these are the gelatas that are, are my favorite monkey because they are really vocally complex. They make lots of different sounds. And so if you... If you just take the sounds that they actually produce, you don't have to do any modeling with x-rays or anything like that. You can just record their vocalizations, and you plot the, the formant space that they occupy, F1 and F2. They actually cover a larger space than the human formant space that we use to produce language. So this red shape is, again, the human um, shape. The blue one is human, again, it's male and female is the difference there. This big circle here is gelata. So this is actually a male gelata. Um, makes a huge variety of sounds. So clearly, monkeys 
are physically capable of making speech. So the question is, why don't they? So if they can make all these sounds and they, they could potentially talk, maybe they just don't have much to say. Um, you know, I don't know, they get by with just a few different sounds, that's good enough. Um, well, let's think about what do primates actually talk about? What kind of sounds do they make and what sort of things might they need to say? Well, one use of sounds or vocalizations could be to sort of label the world, so to talk about things that are out there in the world. Um, a famous sort of classic example of doing this uh, comes from vervet monkeys, and so these are monkeys in Africa that have three different vocalizations that they use in the context of three different predators. So they have one vocalization for when they see a snake, a different vocalization when they see an eagle, and a different vocalization when they see a leopard. And these are all things that can kill and will kill vervets and eat them if they can. Um, the interesting thing is not only that do they have these three different sounds they produce, they have three different responses that go along with the sounds. So if they hear a snake alarm call, they sort of just stand up and look around and say, okay, the snake's not right next to me, it's probably fine. They don't need to flee from a snake as long as they're not gonna step on it accidentally. Um, the eagle sound, if you play that, they'll run and dive into the nearest bush and sort of seek cover. And the eagle's gonna come from above, so they get down underneath things. The leopard, what they'll do is run up the nearest tree and try to get as high as they can. And so leopards can climb trees, but not nearly as well as vervet monkeys. So once they're in the tree, they're pretty safe. So that's the different calls, different responses. All primates have alarm calls, only some of them have multiple alarm call systems like that. Some have three, some have two. Um, our closest relatives, they don't have this complicated alarm call system, but they have different calls for different foods. And it's really the quality of the food. So they have one call that they give in for preferred food items and a different call they give for less preferred food items. And so this is another case where you're sort of labeling in a sense or talking about things that are out there in the world. And so that's one use of vocalization. So you might, if you have more things to talk about in the world, you might have more vocalizations to do that with. A different thing that animals do with sounds is they try to attract partners. And if you think about some of the most elaborate and, and interesting sounds that animals make, bird song and things like that, are these types of vocalizations. They're in this context of trying to attract mates. Um, you know, and these are among the most complicated sounds that non-human animals make. Uh, and generally in these situations, what happens is that it's usually the males who produce the sounds and they're trying to attract a female partner. And the more elaborate or the more complicated sound they can make, the better it is, the more attractive it is. And that's even true of these frogs over here who are out there croaking. So when you hear frogs croaking, they're trying to attract a mate. Um, the males that can add a little twist to their croak and add an extra sound on it are the most attractive ones. So even in this really simple system, more is better. And the important thing to, to think about is that these are all different sounds and they can make really elaborate vocalizations, but they're, the different sounds aren't referring to different things. And a longer or more elaborate call doesn't mean something different from a simpler one. It's just a better way to say, you know, hey, come check me out. So it's a different way to get more complex vocalizations. Okay, so our gelatas, they're very talkative. They make lots of different sounds. But the interesting thing is if you look at them in relation to their closest relatives who are baboons, who are uh, these monkeys that are all over Africa, um, they make about twice as many unique sounds as baboons do. If you line up the calls that baboons make, and you look at those, and you, instead of just counting who has more calls, we can actually compare them and match them up one to one. Every single call that a baboon makes over here, a gelata has a matching call that they make. So it sounds similar and it's used in the same kind of context. And so I'll show you a couple examples. One is the grunt, which is a really important vocalization for a lot of primates. It's a sort of soft, quiet call used in friendly interactions. And it sort of kind of just means, hey, everything's fine, we're calm, we're gonna hang out, um, those kinds of things. And so here's what a, a baboon grunt sounds like. <coughs> and here's a gelata grunt. <coughs> So you can hear the gelatas a lot higher pitch. They just have higher pitch sounds overall. But it's, maybe you can see it's kind of similar that they're both sort of tonal, uh, kind of, you know, calm sounds. And then here's an alarm call that the baboon gives when they see a predator. Ah! That's, it's usually louder than that, but that's, it's quiet right now, but it's, ah! it's a louder, more harsh kind of sound. Ah! Gelatas again, it's still harsh and similar, just, kicked up a notch or an octave. Um, so the gelatas have all the baboon calls, but then they also have these extra calls. And we call these derived calls because we think they evolved on the lineage leading to gelatas. And so they do things like uh, these wobbles, yawns, grunts, and moans, and they make them both when they're exhaling and when they're inhaling. So it's kind of an unusual thing. 
Um, most animals only vocalize on the exhale. Humans mainly do that. We can vocalize on the inhale. Uh, we don't do it very often. And the really interesting thing about these new calls is that they're not using them to talk about things out in the outside world. It's not that they have a bunch of predators they need to, to talk to each other about or they have a bunch of weird foods they want to label. It's all in these friendly contexts. So it's males interacting with females. Um, it's in this bonding sort of attractive context, more like the bird song situation. And we think this makes sense for gelatas because unlike baboons and lots of other uh, closely related uh, African primates, gelatas form long-term bonds between males and females. So a single male will be attached to a family of females for up to, we've seen now, seven or eight years. And they interact closely, they groom, they stay close together, and they form really strong bonds. And so we think this elaborate vocalizations, this elaborate communication is important for this bonding process. Another thing they do is they combine these calls into sequences. So most primates, they may make strings of sounds, but it's the same sound repeated over and over. So a baboon might say grunt, 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 grunt. Gelatos will mix it up. They'll grunt and wobble and yawn and moan, and they'll do it all together. And so you'll hear that. This is a video of a gelato male, and he's going to approach his group of females. You'll hear the females sort of grunting high-pitched in the background at first. Then the male will start vocalizing. He'll make some different calls, and he'll end with a vocalized yawn. And so that's a very typical context. He's approaching his females. They're hanging out together, um, and he's making a bunch of sounds. And we also know that we've done some experiments where we can play these sounds back to the females. And the more elaborate the sound is, the more they seem to like it. They hang out by the speaker longer. They kind of look at it. They seem interested in the elaborate sound. So we think that these, these elaborate sounds help these males form bonds with the females. OK. So now thinking about some of these evolutionary origins of vocal complexity, um, you can think about, well, one way to expand your repertoire to make more kinds of sounds is that you have more things to talk about and more things to label. And so you need a new word for this new thing that you want to label. Um, you know, someone invents the iPhone, you have to come up with a word for it, something like that. And so first you have the need, and then you sort of get the word for it later. Um, but it's not always so clear that that's the direction things go. And so the gelatas seem to be a case where They've elaborated their repertoire. They make a bunch of different sounds, but they're not labeling a bunch of things. So it could be, at least it seems evolutionarily possible, you could get some pretty elaborate vocalizations first and then later figure out what to do with them. And so what kind of meaning do you want to attach to that sound that you're already producing for another reason? And so maybe the direction can go back the other way, too. <clears throat> OK. And there's another thing that gelatas do that is, has a direct parallel to speech, but to understand it, I think we need to teach you or, or explain a bit about speech. And this is something that, again, speech, we're so very immersed in it, but I don't think we have a good sense of how strange it is or a good sense of the mechanics of doing it either. And so I can ask you to say the word tomato, and you could say it very easily. But if I ask you, what's the sequence of mouth movements you need to make to say the word tomato, you probably wouldn't know that until you started to mouth the word tomato. And then you'd say, oh, yeah, I put my tongue up to the roof of my mouth, and then I bring my lips together for the M, and then I pull my tongue back for the A sound. And all those things that you do, and you just do them automatically without thinking about it. And thank goodness you should do it automatically, because imagine if you had to like actively, OK, move my lips up, my tongue back. My, do the, uh, it's hundreds, literally, of movements every second that we're doing as we're speaking. Um, you'd be overwhelmed. But part of the mechanics of producing a sound is, is that if you, if you think about yourself saying tomato, your mouth is moving open and closed as you're making that sound, tomato. And so that's, a, turns out, a universal property of speech is this alternation of mouth opening and closing. And what happens is in the more closed positions, we're making consonants. In the more open position, we're making vowels. And all languages universally alternate these consonant vowels um, structure. And they do it in a, um, about five times a second. So this rhythm of five hertz or five cycles a second is really across all languages, no matter how different they sound, how different types of sounds they combine. They have this five hertz rhythm. And it's also really important for comprehension. So if you take sound and you break up this, this speech rhythm to it, it makes it really hard for us to understand what people are saying. So it seems to be a really fundamental property of human speech. And it's kind of strange, because you don't need to have a rhythm to communicate information. Um, if you think about like a fax machine or a dial-up modem, if people remember what those were, 
those are transmitting lots of information in sort of beepy tonal sounds, but there's no rhythm to it. There's no undulation. There's no consonants and vowels. That's, that's not a necessary part of communicating with sound. So it's kind of strange that all languages have this property. Peter McNeilich, who studies the evolution of language, calls this a frame. And so he has this frame content theory of speech origins. The syllables are the frame, and the content is the particular vowel and consonant pair that you put into this frame. OK. So primates vocalizations lack this rhythm. They don't open and close their mouth as they're vocalizing. It doesn't have this rhythm that uh, speech does. They tend to make sort of flat sounds, or maybe they open their mouth at the end, like the yawn, so it changes in one direction, but it doesn't go back the other way. But they do make rhythmic movements in a behavior called lip smacking. And so this is a universal behavior that all primates essentially have. Uh, and they perform it in friendly, close affiliative interactions when they're hanging out with their relatives or their good friends and they're socializing in a relaxed setting. And this is what this one example of what lip smacking looks like. So it's opening and closing the mouth rapidly. Sometimes there's tongue protrusion, sometimes there's not. Sometimes it's more lip, sometimes it's more the whole mouth. Different species do it a little bit differently. Different individuals do it differently. But all monkeys, all apes, uh, all primates essentially do this behavior. <clears throat> well, where did lip smacking come from? So why do they make this rhythmic kind of movement? Well, it seems like it might have come from grooming. And so if you watch primates groom, and groom is, grooming is the glue of primate society. So the social bond component of grooming is really important. Initially, it seems to have served a, a cleaning f purpose. So they're picking the fleas off each other. There's the picking fleas part. Um, fleas and ticks and other ectoparasites. And that's, so it has this cleaning function. But now it largely has a social bonding function. So it's mainly about just hanging out with your buddies and, and sort of being relaxed and, and sort of like how your dog likes to be pet. So the, if you watch, these are macaques grooming here. Watch the mouth of the animal doing the grooming. They're picking off some fleas and they're eating them. Um, but even though they're not eating them, they're still kind of always moving their mouth open and closed. And so what we think happened is this process called ritualization. Um, the mouth moves themselves and there's little sounds that are associated with it came to sort of represent or stand in for grooming. And so um, you know, the other animals associate that sound with the grooming and maybe the sight of another animal making that sound with grooming. So it has this nice, nice association or nice connotation. And so maybe it became kind of a substitute for grooming. And it'd be really nice to be able to groom at a distance. Like grooming's great, but you have to go over and physically be next to each other and use your hands and go through it. And you can't be feeding, you can't be doing these other things. If you could just look up and lip smack and say, hey, everything's cool, you know, that's much more efficient. OK, so where this is all going is that McNeilage proposed that speech derive from these lip smacking movements. So um, animals, our ancestors produce this lip smacking behaviors. And then somehow that sort of evolved into the speech that we use today. So that means the rhythm comes from this grooming behavior. There's some recent evidence that this might actually be true, this kind of strange sounding idea. Uh, if you go back to these macaques and you put them in the x-ray machine again, this is the same team of, team of people that did this previous study. Um, and you can look at, again, their mouth movements while they're lip smacking in this case. And what you see is that. You have the tongue in red and the lips in the middle and the hyoid bone, which is the little bone around your um, larynx. When they're lip smacking, they all have this peak at 5 hertz. So that's the speech rhythm peak. So they're coordinated, all have the same, freak, the same peak, and it's all at 5 hertz. If they're doing other things like chewing, you don't get this 5 hertz peak. You get different peaks in different places. They're, they're not coordinated in the same way. So that suggests that lip smacking is somehow physically more similar to the production of speech than some of the other things that these monkeys do with their mouths. But the problem for this idea when McNeilish proposed it was that monkeys generally don't vocalize while they lip smack. They might sneak in a grunt, a little short vocalization in between the lip smacks. You may have heard that in the video. But they don't sustain sound through the lip smacking the way we sustain sound constantly while we're producing speech. Or do they? And so this is where our gelatas come in. And they actually produce this vocalization that we call a wobble. And this is really just a combination of lip smacking and vocalizing. And you'll see this male will produce um, some regular lip smacks, so there's no voicing involved. You'll just make the mouth movements, you'll see it. And then um, he'll add the voicing, and you'll hear the sound that results from that. That's a wobble. You'll probably see why we call it a wobble. Um, and so there's the male, 
his females are close to the bottom of the screen. There's another male really close by. It's kind of making everyone nervous. And he's sort of trying to calm the other male down and calm his females down, too, at the same time. So that's the wobble, the wobble, wobble, wobble. So the rapid opening, closing the mouth, and while he's vocalizing. So this gets us this, this lip smacking origin of speech. Uh, the, the steps along the way would be if you start out with grooming, you go through ritualization, you get lip smacking, and then you add voicing. So you just make activate your vocal cords while you're doing it, and you get wobbles, this sort of speech like sound. And then all you have to do this little simple step, you add some meaning in there, and now you have language. Uh, easy. So, so there's speech. OK. So really what this means is that maybe speech is just elaborate grunting. And there's a few reasons to think that this might potentially be true. First of all, um, speech sounds like grunts in a sense. If you compare the different vocalizations that primates make, the alarm calls and the screams and um, grunts, like the grunts are quiet and tonal. Speech is pretty quiet and tonal. You know, alarm calls, it doesn't sound like we're sitting around alarm calling at each other. We're not like shouting loud, harsh sounds at each other all the time. Um, so it sounds like sort of more like grunts. It has this rhythm that may have derived from lip smacking that's used in the same context as grunts, the sort of friendly interactions between individuals. Um, so there's some reason to think that maybe that's where speech came from. It's sort of just elaborate grunting that we're doing. So one last little bit of speculation here. So what was potentially the first spoken word that humans used? Again, my friend McNeilidge, not my friend, I wish he was, but uh, evolutionary linguist, proposed that the first spoken word might have been mama. And so this is an interesting word because it's often one of the first words kids make in development. It's also almost universal across languages that they have some variant of mama, whether it's nana or mama. It's usually the soft consonant sounds paired um, and some of the first sort of um, sounds that infants can make when they're babbling. Uh, and it's also most languages have a contrasting papa or dada type sound for dad. And so that's with the harder consonants. Again, these are some of the very earliest sounds that, that infants make. Universal across languages. And so it's very possible that a mom and a baby are sort of hanging out in this friendly, relaxed contest. They're making little murmuring sounds to each other, whispering sort of sweet nothings, but I guess that's more of a mating context. Um, but they're making friendly sounds. Uh, they're just sort of relaxed and then making sounds to, uh, to soothe each other, maybe. At some point, somebody figured out that, well, Maybe we can use the sound to refer to each other. And so if I need mama, I can make this sound, and mama might understand that I'm referring to her, and she might come over. And if mama repeats the sound back to the baby, she's sort of implying to the baby that this is me. And maybe you know, once you sort of take that back and forth repeating to each other, you can create this word, so the sound that you're already making, and attach it to something. So that's a possibility. And this is what Peter McNeilich has proposed. And it sort of fits in with this lip-smacking um, vocal grooming kind of idea of language origins. So back to this idea of um, the direction. So maybe the sound came first, this sort of ma, 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 ma type sounds, and you figure out, oh, let's use that to, to, to talk about somebody. And so the context that need labels, maybe it's not things out there in the world. Maybe it was other individuals, other people, sort of social context that we need to, to think about as potential routes towards language. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? So you said that the like vocal tract is fairly speech ready, but I feel like a very important aspect of language is syntax, right? And there's not really a whole lot of vocal combination or sequential planning of vocal sequences. And you do see that in gestures of a lot of primates. So how do you think the lip smacking would have gone to some sort of meaningful combination? Yeah, that's a really good point that syntax is a critical part of language and something that um, you know other animals don't do a lot of in terms of combining. And I said the gelatas do a bit more of it, but it doesn't have a key component of syntax is not just combining sounds together, but creating new meanings when you combine these sounds together. So talking about more complex things as you add more things together. Um, that's something our relatives don't do. The, I don't 
this sort of um, idea is, first of all, I think focus on the very initial steps, and so maybe the syntax will come in later. You don't need syntax until you have a vocabulary of several words and several different things you can talk about. Um, but it's, yeah, it doesn't really have, I think, necessarily too much to say about the syntax part, but it's a great point. Just, it seemed like the, uh, the lip smacking seemed like um, nursing also, mm -hmm. which is sort of a soothing, I don't know if there was a, maybe that was also a connection like from the very beginning and yeah, it seemed like that to me. Yeah, definitely. And that's where this, I think the idea of mama is the first word. Um, some of the thinking about that is some of the sounds that infants make when they're nursing are sort of sound like mama kind of sounds or, and so there are, um, yeah, there's different, and I think they're all kind of related in the sense that they're sort of feeding, but they're sort of social too, like nursing and grooming and you know, things like that. So um, they could, could be both things kind of happening too. Okay, any more questions? Chris. Hey, thank you so much, that was fantastic. The, I, I, I just wonder if I could just ask a little, something a little bit out of your area in the parrots. I'm just still taken with the parrots from the beginning. <laughs> and I, I just wonder, like, it's just so fun. I mean, I understand they don't really have true language but it is so amazing, their, their imitation abilities. And I was wondering, like, you spent a bit, bit of time talking about, like, the phenomenal larynx in the human. How does their larynx compare? Is it, is it I imagine it is quite, um, quite adept. Yeah, so the, uh, for birds, you, like, it, so the birds that mimic, so their larynx, they're actually, all birds have a double larynx. So as your uh, air tract goes down, it splits to your two lungs their vocal cords are after that split or below that split, so they have one for each lung, essentially. So birds have two vocal cords, and they can actually produce two sounds simultaneously, and that contributes to their ability to make really complex songs. I don't think it's necessarily related to their mimicking abilities, though, because some birds learn their songs and some don't. Lots of birds, they're sort of like primates in that if you deafen them at birth, they'll still produce their normal calls, and that's, they're kind of like monkeys that way. Um, but they still have this complicated double syrinx anatomy um, and potentially the mechanical ability to make really complicated sounds. They just don't seem to have the cognitive ability. And so it seems like there's some things that happen in the brain that make it possible to mimic sounds that birds that learn song have and humans have. Birds that don't learn song lack it. Other primates seem to lack it. And so what, mainly what it comes down to is really strong connections between the part of the brain that produced speech, which is sort of Broca's areas, sort of frontal areas, and part of the brain in the back that comprehends speech, like Wernicke's area and things like that, you need really strong connections in both directions there because you need to be able to perceive sound coming in and identify it, but then push it into the motor planning kind of area to make that matching sound. But then also you need feedback to see, is the sound I'm making matching what I'm hearing? And so you have to have these really strong connections there. And it seems like the animals that don't mimic sound are missing those connections in a sense. Okay, any more questions? Would you say that most of the studies are done exclusively with the English language, or are there any other ones like with different language types that they try? Yeah, there's lots of um, studies in general in terms of um, you know language and language evolution done with lots of different languages. The most of the studies with the apes that were done in terms of teaching apes language were done in English, just because they, most of them happened in the United States, I think. Um, but there are some exceptions to that, I think, so. Okay, anybody else? Okay. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit how the, because um, you said that they had, in some of the studies, they used like a, um, model of a vocal tract and pushing sound through it in like sort of a, a facsimile of, of speech. I don't know if that's like computer generated or, or, or what, and I was wondering if you could explain like how that kind of technology came about and, and works. Yeah, so they they were computer generated and it was, it's actually been around for a long time that you could simulate sounds um, based on how they pass through different tubes. And so essentially they're modeling a tube and you can vary the 
dimensions of the tube along the pathway, and we have a pretty good understanding of how that affects sound. And so they can just sort of essentially say, you know, given the shape of, of the uh, tube that the sound's passing, passing through, what's going to come out the other end? And that's been doable since the 60s, really. So I, I don't think that's a really too difficult of a computational problem, but it's something we know how to do for sure. Okay, anybody else? I was just wondering what, what's coming next. Um, you know, w what's the hot topic that's going to answer the next question? <laughs> that's a really good question. So, um, you know, I think we, we tried for a while to kind of come at it from the top of, like, let's teach these animals language, and that, that didn't get us all that far. And now I think we're coming up from the, the bottom more and looking at some of this variation. And so I think what we really need to get a better sense of is, is why some animals mimic and some don't, and, and this ability to copy in terms of, making these complex sounds. So we, ha we have some idea of the brain architecture that, that does it, but we have less of an understanding of you know, why some animals get pushed down this evolutionary pathway towards copying sounds and some don't. I think that was a really big part of our um, evolution. But then it's, you know, that's just getting you going, and then you have all these other things like syntax and things that start to come in, and so we need to, to, to figure out how they come in too. So I, I think you know, we're making some progress, but it is a really tricky problem in that it's this really complicated thing happened but it only happened once, and so like we can't really compare it directly to anything else, since we have to come at it from really indirect directions to try and see what happens. So, okay, any more questions? Okay, right front. Thank you. Is it possible to ask which language is the oldest in the world? Um, you know, I. I don't think there is, none of the languages I think that exist now would be like the original language and it's persisted. Languages evolve so fast that it erases their history pretty quickly, especially up until we started writing them down, which wasn't that long ago. Once we started writing them down, that kind of froze languages a bit more, but not entirely. I mean, you try to read English from 400 years ago, it's hard to read. Um, so it's still languages migrate and they move really quickly. So I think it's, it's really hard. We, it happened long enough ago that it's been erased by all the changes that have happened. So it's, it's yeah. Um, thanks so much for a great talk. Um, I was kind of thinking, you know, I, a, I don't really know if um, music is specifically unique to humans or like music outside of mating. Um, and I was just kind of wondering if music plays any role in, or there's a theory that like music affects, you know, the development of speech and whether music might have actually, you know, all of these sounds coming together might have come before um, the spoken word. Yeah, and then, so there's actually, there's a um, language evolution uh, researcher, Tecumseh Fitch, who is a big proponent of musical origins of language. So you have these different kind of camps. There's like the gestural origins people and the, there's some musical origins people. Um, and I think, like, there is some good evidence for it. And the, some of these rhythm things clearly connect to music, and so there are some overlaps there. Um, humans are particularly, I think, musically interested and sort of drawn to music, um, but other animals do show, you know, they will respond to music and, and things like that. So I think that's a really interesting idea, and there is some, um, some evidence for it and some more to, to pursue in that setting. Okay, any more questions? Oh, all right, two more. Um, could you speak at all on the vocal tracks of marine mammals and how the medium through which the sound is carried affect, has affected the evolution of language? Yeah, so their vocal anatomy is quite different, so they can make sounds in, in a few different ways. Um, but I, I, maybe I'll just take it in a slightly different direction to say that marine mammals are really interesting because they do a lot of copying of sounds that other mammals don't seem to do. And so, like, dolphins... Uh, have what's called a signature whistle, and so in some species, each individual have their own unique call that they make, and when they sort of meet a new group of dolphins, pretty quickly those other dolphins will copy that call back to them, and they seem to sort of call each other by these signature whistles. And so that's something that's really cool and sort of language-like that marine mammals do, but primates don't, except for humans. So um, it's interesting as a sort of an evolutionary analogy and why these marine mammals seem so vocally adept 
Um, maybe it's because like visual information is just more limited in the aquatic environment and sound does travel well. Um, you know, uh, we don't know. This, this sort of plays off that a little bit. Um, I was curious about the hearing frequency that these, you know, different species have and how does that play into, you know, most of the mammals, you, uh, the ocean, you, they have high pitch sounds. Mm -hmm. Is that the limits of their hearing? You know, they say dogs hear sounds, you know, yep. humans don't hear, and yep. how does that affect the, you know, the, the baboons and all those guys? Yeah, that's a really good question, and, and um, you know, different animals do have different ranges that they can hear sound in, um, and that's something we definitely have to be aware of, because, like, dogs, they could be, you know, hearing something in the call that we're not hearing, and so we always have to be aware of that. We think most of the, the baboons, the geladas, and then, like, some of the, a lot of the larger monkeys, and the apes have roughly similar hearing range to humans, and where it's been studied directly, it's, it's pretty comparable. Um, often it goes along with body size, so smaller animals tend to shift up to higher frequencies. Bigger animals tend to use lower frequencies. Um, but there's definitely variations, definitely something to, to be aware of and pay attention to, yeah. All right, any more questions? No, looks like we're all set, okay. Thank you again so much for this wonderful presentation and um, very grateful for the series. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you.